Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. Today is Friday, April 26, 2019, starting at 7:28 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the hundred and uh, or no, it's actually the 204th episode of the show. Joining me today is David Rayleigh, and we're going to be talking about the practice of modern Western astrology in modern China today. Mm. Uh, hey, David, thanks for joining me. Chris, I've been looking forward to this since you act. Yeah, uh, you hosted. You, this is your first uh, time in an individual interview with me on the podcast, but you actually appeared in a previous podcast episode when I recorded and released the recording of the ESAR panel from UAC last That's year. That's right. Yeah, so this is technically your second appearance on the show, but thanks for joining me today. And thank you for doing that recording at UAC. I was above and beyond the call of duty, definitely. Yeah, well, I appreciated that you organized that panel because it was an important discussion topic in the wake of the yes. 2016 elections when the community was sort of processing what happened and figuring out how to go forward from there. So right. I appreciated you sort of heading up that discussion. Um, but our topic today, uh, you're actually in town f because you're organizing, you're the vice president of the International Society for Astrological Research, right? That's correct. And you guys are in town planning a conference for next year for September of 2020? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I'm excited about that. That's going to be in Denver, and it's going to have something like 600 people, so it's probably going to be the biggest conference of next year, right? Yes. We hope 600, you know, maybe 700. Yeah. I mean, NORWAC, the Northwest Astrological Conference, sold out for the first time, yes, I think, ever this I year. Heard. So I think astrology has really surged in popularity over the past few years, and there's a whole new generation of like Pluto and Sagittarius people coming into the field at this time. Yes. So, you know, who knows, maybe next year's ESAR conference will sell out as well. Yes. We certainly hope so. We were talking a little bit today about Pluto and Sagittarius generation and contribution we hope they'll make to the field. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um so our topic today, you um you've had a long career in astrology. Uh, you're you're originally from Atlanta, right? That's correct. Okay, but you right now currently live in Beijing, China, and you yes. actually teach at an astrology school there. You teach hundreds of students. This is this is also true. Okay, um, and that's going to be our main topic today: is just the practice of astrology in modern China, because you have a really unique perspective on that. Mm -hmm. And while I did a previous episode on the practice or in the development of Ch of astrology in China historically and some connections with the West through a transmission of certain texts in ancient times, we sort of ended that episode. I think it was episode 181 with Jeffrey Kotick. Mm -hmm. um, in modern times, when things started to change in the 20th century in terms of the practice of astrology in China. Mm -hmm. And so I thought you'd be a good person to talk to since you've been actively involved over the past decade with teaching and bringing Western astrology to China for contemporary students. I would like to watch that podcast. Yeah, I'll have to much, yeah. show it to you. I think you would enjoy it. So let's see. So let's start with some background information on you. Mm -hmm. So when did you start studying astrology? Um, I was 19 years old. I was a journalism major in college. And um, some friends of mine uh, who were serious students of astrology introduced me to it, and I was curious, and it started there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in 1970, you said? That's right. Actually, March 1970. Okay. And Uranus transit to my Mercury, kind of appropriate. Brilliant. I love that. Yeah. I had, mm -hmm. when I discovered astrology, as a Uranus transit to my ascendant. So, right. somewhat similar. Um, so, things went pretty fast from that point, though. It seems like when I was reading your, your biography in terms of your studies, or, or where did you go from there? You started actually getting training or seeking out specific teachers to learn the subject? I had two mentors, Rosemary Jones, who was a professional astrologer in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and then Vicki Green, who was a full-time professional in Virginia Beach. Okay. Uh, and of course, I had influence from others in the field. Um, locally, Bill Tierney was a big influence on me. Oh, wow. He's kind of a, a reclusive legend these days, but he was a great astrologer. Yeah, he yeah. wrote one of the first. It's a, like a widely popular book, Dynamics of Aspect yes. Analysis, right. um, as well as like later in the two thousands, he wrote a great series on the outer planets. Yes, uh, but he, yeah, I haven't seen him ever like speak at conferences anytime I've been in the community. No. I meet with him when I'm in Atlanta, maybe once a year, and uh, so it started then. And in some ways, uh, the beginning of my study of astrology in nineteen seventy coincided 
with the um, city ordinance being changed as a result of a change in the state law about astrology. Okay. When I started studying astrology, I didn't know this had happened, but there was this coincidence. So the the law in the city changed against astrology, or it made it no, harder no, to what practice. What happened was uh, the state law was declared uh, unconstitutional because they had a prohibitive license fee prior to 1970, and astrology was lumped in with fortune telling and everything else, as is often the case. Okay, and the um, it was a five thousand dollar license fee which okay. at that point is a much greater sum than even today. Right. And so there was a, uh, a serious organization of astrologers in Atlanta at the time, mm. and they met with the legislators at the state. They lobbied. Uh, you know, they said, we need this law needs to be changed and so forth. And once it was changed, then all the cities and towns had to change their ordinances, Atlanta being the biggest city, the capital city of Georgia, the biggest city in the southeast, changed their ordinance. But they also met with the local astrologers. Maxine Taylor is a real pioneer in this. She's got an interesting story to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and astrology was defined legally as separate from fortune telling. They set up requirements for being an astrologer, which included passing a written examination and also having a uh, board of astrology examiners who would draw up the exam every year, uh, administer the exam, and be there for the public uh, to uh, represent the field if there were any complaints, uh, professional complaints or any, any kind of complaints in that field. So Atlanta was a pioneer city with astrology. It was a, it was a great place to, to grow up with astrology, to learn astrology. Yeah, that sounds like one of the first, essentially, both a success story in terms of astrologers fighting back against laws that were banning astrology or or unnecessarily or going too far in terms of trying to hamper its practice, and then it becomes like a success story in terms of being one of the first instances of setting up professional certification. Yes. So it was literally setting up a certification board, and, and that still exists today, right? Yes. The, the law is still on the books. Um, uh, the exams that are recognized ha have been expanded, mm -hmm. so the need for the for a board to draw up a separate exam every year no longer exists because other professional exams are recognized okay. by the ordinance. So like the ESAR, uh, for example, certification or, right. or NCJAR certification? And, and AFA. Okay. All of those are, are recognized. Yeah, and those are the big three national organizations? Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. More or less. More or less, yeah. I'm trying to think of it. I mean, the only other major one, of course, is AFAN, which you were on the board of a few that's years right. ago. Yeah, for about four years. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. So so that's all happening in like the 1970s. 70s, yeah. So what happened was I took, and I'll, I'll be completely frank about this, as I tell my students to sort of encourage them. The first time I took the exam was in 74. Okay. I, I failed it. Okay. Um, uh, I made it because back then you had to calculate everything by hand, mm -hmm. and the chart you interpreted was the one you actually calculated by hand. I made some math errors okay. with my formula. So even though my interpretation, they said, was pretty interesting for the chart that I came up with, it was the, not the right chart. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> was I it like the wrong ascendant or like <laughs> wrong... It was, it was like way off. Okay. All right. And so I, I had to wait a year to take it again. Mm -hmm. And I took it again in uh, November 75 and passed flying colors this time. And got my license from the city of Atlanta in January of 76. And then um, I was still, you know, my background was journalism. I was still uh, working, uh, for, I, I had, was working for the Atlanta Journal. Um, and in 78, I was able to go cold turkey with astrology um, and not have any other source of, of income. And I would sit, so maybe by 1980, like a 10 year process, mm -hmm. um, I felt more comfortable and secure as an astrologer at that point. So it took me 10 years from the, the beginning point till 1980 to get to that place, and that's when Jeff and I 
open the daily planets together. Right. That's one of the things that's really funny for people that know Jeff's later history yes. and Jeff Jarr's later history and partnership eventually with Rick Levine is mm -hmm. that you guys actually were partnered up years earlier and did a lot of work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as he used to, I was his first wife. That's what he always used to say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what did what was the Daily Planet? The Daily Planet's plural, so we wouldn't be confused with Superman and Clark Kent. Okay, it was um, an astrology center uh, in Little Five Points, where Crystal Blue is today. If, for those who are in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and we uh, were there for about four years. And Jeff also was a licensed astrologer; he took the exam for the city and so forth. And we had a lot of out of town astrologers come in that we would host. Um, and put on workshops, and it was a hub hmm. for the astrological community. That's so interesting that it turned from something where astrology was literally being oppressed, you know, in that area, in that city, especially to mm -hmm. something where it was flourishing through astrologers getting engaged and, mm -hmm. you know, really trying to fight back against the law, but then also work with the lo local ordinances to set up. Something that would be like amenable to like having some oversight in the community. It was really about building relationships, you know, mm -hmm. rather than seeing whether it's a local government or a state government or a federal government is, is something to be afraid of or you know whatever. It's really about building relationships. Mm -hmm. I know that's a very Libra thing to say, but are those astrologers who pioneered uh, in the '70s in Atlanta—that's what they did. They they went out there. They were just very open. And they, they built those relationships with, back then it wasn't even the city council. It was called the Board of Aldermen. It was before they actually had a city council. Okay. And so it, it serves as a model, even though the model, unfortunately, has not been duplicated nationwide. We, we certainly hoped that it would be. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's really, if there's any lesson from that, I think it's that it, you can do it. And it's about being patient and building relationships. Okay. And you said Maxine Taylor was one of the oh, yeah. uh, main astrologers who was really influential in terms of heading that up? Yes, and my teacher Rosemary Jones and Louise Bromley and wow, and Rini Goodale and, and you know who was also a big supporter of Project Hindsight, mm -hmm. you know. Um, these were people who um, really worked hard to make that happen. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And I think I'm trying to think of other cities like Las Vegas is one of the only other big cities that I can think of offhand that has sort of a, a law like that where you have to get some sort of um, certification or you have to, I don't know if you have to actually pass a test, but it's almost mm -hmm. like you have to pay a fee in order to practice in the city limits or something like that. I think there's one other city in Ohio and maybe a couple of other places, but I haven't kept up with it. Okay. Mm hmm. Um, so that was, and you, you practiced astrology for mm -hmm. years in Atlanta, and mm -hmm. eventually later in your career, you published a book in 2003, right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And that was a book primarily about the nodes, right? The lunar nodes. It was a general book uh, about the lunar nodes through the signs, mm -hmm. um, and which had been my focus. I, I came across in 1972 a passage uh, in Rudra's uh, Astrology of Personality, classic book, where right. he talked about the lunar nodes. And he sent, he essentially said that in this one paragraph that the lunar nodes could help to explain the why of the whole person's life. And I remember looking at that and thinking, really? I, is that true? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and and because that seemed like a pretty big deal to me. Right. You know? And so um, I began to focus on that. Okay. And in my in my work as a student, you know, I was testing it with people all the time. You know, I would talk to them about the nodes and so forth. So it became area of focus. And in 2003, I finally got a book out about it. And then I wrote a second edition in uh, 2009. Actually, in 2008, came out in 2009. Okay. It, it's interesting that you, just to, not to interrupt that mm. point, but it's interesting that you were so influenced by that passage in Rudyard because I've tried to trace back like modern um, thinking on the lunar nodes yes. and especially the focus and, and where that shifted and that passage in Rudyard because it's not a terribly like huge section no, in the astrology not, right. of personality, mm -hmm. but it actually turned out to be a really seminal. Um, just it's not even a chapter; it's just like a subsection mm -hmm. almost where he talks about the nodes and he introduces what ended up being some very influential 
thoughts and sort of speculations about like how they could be interpreted. And that really generated just a ton of different traditions surrounding the nodes in the 20th and early 21st century. Yes. I, of course, as I'm sure you've surmised, I think Rudra was very much influenced by, by Vedic astrology and some of his thinking about that and his and theosophy and so forth, I think. His, the influence of India certainly is evidence there, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's see. So you published the book in mm -hmm. 2003. And what was the title again, really quick? Oh, it's The Sole Purpose. Okay. And it's, you know, the pun on the word instead of S-O-L-E, S-O-U-L. You know? Okay. Yeah. I like that. Uh -huh. uh, and you published the revised edition in 2008, 2009. That's right. And then you started touring to promote the, the revised edition. Actually, right? I did. What happened was I just ended up, at the, at, by 2009, I had some students that I was uh, mentoring, teaching online in China. Mm -hmm. And um, my in early 2009, uh, the second edition came out, and I got some good reviews online. I got a good review from Noel Till. I got a good review from uh, Star IQ and others. And my students who like to surf these sites mm -hmm. saw the reviews, and they said, hey, we didn't know about your book. Did you know you could publish that here? And I said, really? I said, I had no idea. In China? In China, okay. yes. And, and, and so the next thing I knew, uh, there were three Chinese publishing companies of these students had referred them to me, mm -hmm. um, who were uh, vying for the publication of the book. So I just went with the best deal, which was at the time an advance and a book tour, all paid book tour of China. Wow. Yeah, exactly. It was That was my first reaction too. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. So yeah. you you actually did that or you started doing it in 2010? Actually, uh, that was in 2009 mm -hmm. when I had the contract. It was like May. And then I spent the whole summer rewriting the book for a third time for a Chinese audience. Because okay. even though I had a historical familiarity as an amateur with China, I knew very little really about modern China. Mm -hmm. So my translator, Jiang Ning, who was Felicia Jiang, okay. right, you've met her. Yeah. Uh, she was my cliff notes on modern China. Okay. And not only did, was she the translator, she um, schooled me in modern China. And so my rewriting of the book was taking examples from well-known people in America and substituting in well-known people in China. Okay. Because the Chinese wouldn't know this was otherwise. Yeah, mm -hmm. like using like Arnold Schwarzenegger's chart or like <laughs> something like that. Yes, uh, you uh, know. Putting in one of the Song Sisters, for example, they would know who that is, you know. Okay. And, and um, any well-known uh, people. And, and since it was just a book on the lunar nodes through the signs, I didn't have to worry so much about the birth time. Okay. And, and because birth times are hard to come by in China for famous people. Are they recorded at all? Yes. Oh, they're recorded, but still hard to come by. But not public. It's not public no. information. No, it's not. Got it. Okay. Right. Um, how did you connect? How did you first get connected with Felicia, who ended up helping you in that Th way? Through Star IQ. Okay. Uh, uh, one of my areas of expertise for most of my practice, or developed in my practice, mm -hmm was chart rectification, which Jeff used to call chart wrongification. Um, why, and, why is that or what's well, the joke? Well, just because he that? felt like, how can you be sure? You know, right. you've come, you worked so hard on this, but what if it's wrong? I mean, anyway, I won't go into to that part of it. But so he would say, I don't like to do this. So he would send them to me. Okay. So for over 20 something years, anytime someone said they wanted a rectification, he just sent them to me. Okay. And that's how I. That's how Felicia found me. Okay. She was on Star IQ, and Jeff said, "Here's David's email." That's what happened. Got it. So, and that that was, of course, Star IQ is the website that Jeff Jar Rick, ran with Rick Levine that's right. uh, in the 2000s, and actually, it was a pretty big website. Uh, yeah. I mean, it still is, still is uh, yeah. to this day, and has a lot of really great info on it. Mm -hmm. But that's funny. So, you got that referral initially as a rectification client from Jeff. That's right. Uh, then you get that connection with Felicia, and then she encourages you to, or, or you start working with her, mm -hmm. basically. Well, I rectified her chart, and then she she was interested in studying, so she became one of my students. Okay. What drew you to rectification in the first place? Um, how did you fall into that? It's, I think, a natural love of puzzles, right? Logical puzzles. Uh, 
You could explain it by the fact that Saturn in my chart is in Virgo, conjunct the south node in the ninth house, square my ascendant within one degree. Okay. So um, there's a, a love of trying to solve that puzzle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's tedious and time consuming, and rarely do you get verification. Right. Occasionally you do, and that's always nice. Oh. Like, like when you find out afterwards mm -hmm. that somebody like finds their birth certificate out of nowhere. And that's or, happened. Right. And it's so. That's when you call up all your friend astrologers, right? <laughs> you know, and say, "Guess what?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I like that. And is you you mentioned your birth chart? Is your data public, or is that something you oh, share? Oh, public. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's your data? Just out of curiosity. Sure. October fourteenth, nineteen fifty. Okay. Twelve of five p.m. in Atlanta. Okay. What's your rising sign? It's a Sagittarius. Sag, yeah. and then Sun and Moon. Moon is Sagittarius. Sun Libra. Okay. Sun and Libra and Moon. And cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So you start working with Felicia at that point. You get the book translated into Chinese, yes. and then eventually you start touring in China in order to promote it. Well, that because I had this book deal, mm -hmm. you know, with Leaping Publishing. Um, I got this book tour, which basically meant going from one bookstore to the next. And I also lectured at a Waldorf school uh, in Beijing, which was fun, an alternative school there. Okay. And um, what I found right away was that there was a level of interest and enthusiasm for Western astrology that was beyond anything I'd ever seen anywhere. Okay. It just if you've seen the documentary, you've seen some of the old scenes in the bookstore. I think you may have seen a few of them. Uh, and it was, it, it, I was immediately, from all the questions that were asked me, because we'd be in there until the bookstore would close down, they'd have to make us all leave, you know. Right. So you, you were having like just tons, uh, what, hundreds of like younger astrology students attending yes. these lectures that you're giving, and you're kind of blown away by the response and how much interest oh. it seemed to have generated. Yes. And, some of the answers showed real sophistication, like they'd really been studying online. Mm -hmm. And then the same person would ask another question that showed they didn't know very much at all. It's like so very, you know, uneven, very erratic um, mm -hmm. level of uh, knowledge and awareness. Because they were kind of piecing together bits and pieces they could find online in That's terms exactly of studying. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. It was a reflection of internet, internet study. And, and maybe because sometimes that happens. I notice sometimes with people that are self-taught, that's more if you're not able to study with a specific teacher or a specific uh, school. Sometimes mm -hmm. that can happen. Um, it, was that part of the issue as well? Yeah, you know, I, I also think it was just there's there was no way to be able to um, prioritize uh, the information they were getting. In other words, they didn't know is 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 this coming from a reasonably responsible, credible source or not. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's that issue. You know? Sure. Um, so then you end up deciding to uh, partner up with mm -hmm. Felicia That's to right. found a school in China. Yes. Okay. It it ha it evolved uh, in 2010, 2011, along with the launching of a website, you know, which was Nodor.com. Okay. Which we launched in June of 2011. And that's uh, the name of the school, right? Yes, it's the Nodor School of Astrology. And what's the meaning behind that term? Well, in Chinese, it's Rodao. And, and it actually has layers of meaning. We, uh, we chose No Door because it was also easy in English to remember, but particularly easy in Chinese. Okay. And it has, if you say, if you say literally No Door, it kind of, in Chinese, what it can mean is like, no way. Like, mm. no way this could work, or no way this problem could be solved, or no way this could exist. So it was kind of a pun on that term about astrology, no way, Okay, in a, in a sense. But then we found out that there was a Chinese Buddhist monk in the 12th century who had built his whole philosophy, we called what he called the no door philosophy, meaning that the spiritual world was open to everyone. There was no door. Interesting. And then the other part of it was uh, what came to me when we were developing the name was that when you look at the sky, there is no wall. Mm. And if there is no wall, there is no door. Sure, you know I so like that. This was just the that's where the name came from. Okay, yeah. Um, and so people can find that at at nodor com. That's your main website for that's the school, mm -hmm. um, and it's in Chinese. And so over the past decade, 
Um, how did that go? Because you initially started offering classes uh, in, was it in Beijing or where, where is it located? Beijing. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the capital. The capital of China. Yes. Um, and so let's back up a little bit and talk about okay. the status of astrology in China. Because one of the mm -hmm. things, I have some questions and some areas where I'm not very clear. Um, from what I understood when I was talking to Jeffrey Kotick, when we got up to the modern period, it seemed like there were two streams of astrology in China. There was the indigenous forms of astrology that developed in China, especially around the time of the Han Dynasty. Yes. And that was largely, especially like mundane astrology, mm -hmm. um, but also had some elements of what you might refer to as a type of natal astrology with like the, the diff different animal totems that people might be familiar with from Chinese astrology, right? It's true. The Chinese uh, had in, uh, different constellations okay. than we use. Their, their own, like the Aztecs did, like the Mayans did, you know, and so forth. Okay. Um, and you're right, there was an imperial astrology mm -hmm. that had some cross-cultural influence from India, a, a little, but was was also very indigenous as yeah, well. Yeah, was largely indigenous. Right. And then Jeffrey's research, which is kind of new and kind of unique, was that there was also this other stream that was kept uh, separate, which was um, some texts on like Greek astrology mm -hmm. were translated into Persian and then yes. translated into yes. Chinese at some point and made it as far over as Japan at, mm -hmm. at some point. And so that was a separate stream of like almost Western natal astrology that was practiced in China all the way up until I think Jeffrey said like the 18th or 19th century. But then once we get to the 20th century, mm -hmm. um, due to some of the changes in the government and, and political changes, mm -hmm. astrology becomes um, sort of a casualty th to that and, and mm -hmm. is sort of outlawed. Is that, am I understanding well, it correctly? there's so much that, be, that changed. Um, let me see if I can take a complicated subject and make it simple. sure. Um, in the United States, we had a civil war that lasted four years. Mm -hmm. China had a civil war that lasted 140 years. Wow. Okay. Okay. So even with the attempt at a at creating a at the time a more what we would now call a kind of democracy, which was was Sun Yat Sen, in 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 1914, mm -hmm. you know, with that that movement, um, China was still undergoing a civil war, and uh, that civil war was still going on when the Japanese invaded. Okay, so China went through hell. The whole culture was. Uh, constantly in a state of, of, of war, revolution, violence. And it's hard to even, for us to even imagine what that was like. Sure. So when the communist um, emerged uh, victorious in 1949, um, their attitude was, you know, let's, let's make everything new. It was kind of like a, an extreme political decor, Chinese style, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is everything old, it's bad. Everything, Confucius, all Chinese traditions. So we're going to eliminate all of that. So it wasn't just astrology. It was it was everything. Sure, you know. So it was, uh, you know, the the party line still is um, atheist, uh, mechanistic science, um, which is barred from the West, of course, but became the establishment in terms of the party line. Okay, so maybe it was part of a general rejection of, of older religious philosophies and uh, modes of divination and things like that? All of it. All of it, okay. Yeah, astrology was officially labeled, uh, and still today on the books, as feudal superstition. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, All astrology. So, and it's basically outlawed both the practice as well as publishing? Well, uh, it's uh, again, it's a more complex area than that. Um, the first horoscope, the first modern Western horoscope to appear in China. And what do you mean by, by horoscope? Do you mean like chart? Like or a 12, like, no, no, like a like sun, sun Yeah, let me clarify okay. that. Like newspaper horoscope, uh, which was on Cena.com. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that didn't appear until the year 2000. Okay. So, that some... was, so that was, if we're talking about when did Western astrology, begin to surface without anybody saying, no, you can't do that. 
That started around 2000. So maybe with the advent of the internet. Yes. But prior to that time, even though sun sign astrology in the West started flourishing from like the 1950s onward, mm -hmm. that was something that was completely absent in China up to the 2000s? That's right. Okay. Clearly. We're talking mainland China. That's right. Okay. So um, was there any survival of any of the indigenous forms of like Chinese astrology? Or for example, I know there's some differences between there's like mainland China mm. where Beijing, the capital, and, and where people think of China when, when they mention sure. it is, but there's also some of that issue with Taiwan. Of and course. Well, it, you know, so let's say that uh, there were areas where the traditions were kept and practiced, mm -hmm. such as Hong Kong oh, or yeah. in Taiwan, and in all of the uh, Chinese communities, San Francisco, uh, you name it, all over the world, the traditions were kept alive. But the origin of those traditions, the central birth of those traditions, gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, were there any like underground practice of it still, or was it still something that was done even in secret, or was it just completely, as far as you know? As far as I know, um, it was, as far as I know, no, there was, there was no practice. Okay. Um, but then that starts to change then, let's say, with the advent of the internet yes. around the late 90s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. and you think... Is that one of the first things that changed? Is that a horoscope column appeared on Cena, or were there other things happening as well? Um, that's the first thing I know of that changed, and and that just sort of began the awareness of oh, I have a sign, you know. Mm -hmm. And it took years from that little point for mm -hmm. people to begin to get more interested. I mean, that's really interesting, almost surprising, because I'd almost think that at least some knowledge of like the notion of like the year of the dragon or like the year I'm I'm born in the year of the rat would have survived on some low level. Uh, well, sure, there was a, there was still the lunar calendar. Okay, and the lunar calendar has in it, um, just like the almanacs in the West used to, mm -hmm. some things that you could say were astrological, but no one used that term. Okay, you know. No one referred to it as that. They referred to it as the lunar calendar. Sure. So it's just being used for like calendrical and timekeeping purposes. Well, sure, it was the, the calendar of China. Got it. In fact, even today you have your your lunar calendar birthday, mm -hmm. and then you have your birthday in the Western calendar that they adopted. Okay. Right. Got it. So then, but with the advent of the internet and um, some of that couldn't be kept completely in check. And Sina mm -hmm. dot com yeah. though, that's like a it's not a state-run website, but it's like okay on some level, or or what is Cena? It's like a news website. And they were really probably they were the major at one point platform in China uh, before all the other platforms came up. They were the biggest at one time. Okay, and they still have an astrology channel. Uh, uh, in fact, um, uh, we're good friends with them, to say the least. You know, I've been on their on their uh, internet TV many times. Okay. Uh, they recently interviewed Alan Oaken uh, when he was in China. Okay. Um, Ji, Ji Yun, who is the head of that channel, she even came to UAC uh, in New Orleans in 2012, brought a, I, I managed to get a small film crew uh, to UAC from China and they interviewed you. I yeah, think. I yeah. remember you guys did interviews with a ton of astrologers oh, at the time. So, that was a first. Hmm. And we were showing those in China. China was still a little more open at that point. Okay. Mm -hmm. So right. So you okay. So you found No Door in 2010. That's correct. Um, you start teaching classes. Uh, yeah, in 2012, I remember that you came with a film crew, with the Cena film crew, to interview mm -hmm. a bunch of Western astrologers, That's and right. that was posted on their website. Um, you started doing certification, I think, at one point in like 2013, right? Yeah, we did a little bit of that in 2012, but not much. Uh, because we had people that had started studying with us in the fall of, of 2010. And that went on through all of 2011 and 2012. But we didn't really develop our certification fully or to, to a greater degree until 2013. And, and then we became uh, an ESAR-affiliated school in 2013. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to say this briefly. When I was on my book tour and even subsequent travel mm -hmm. in China during those early years. I didn't want the focus to be 
on me in my book. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was fine with that. I had a PPT that showed all of the all of the organizations in the West, you know, AFAN and NCGR, all of them. Websites, this is what's going on in the West. Okay. These are places you can go to find astrologers. These are places you can go to learn about astrologers. You know, so I had this uh, PPT to just sort of expose people to the West to say, because I wanted them to know what are trusted places to go. Right, where can they find more yes. information about this? Yes, and the, I think even though I was, you know, uh, with AFAN, you know, for four years and still support AFAN, the, the one organization that stepped forth the most to be supportive of what we were trying to do with our school was ESAR. Okay. They were amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah, and they had because in the late '90s and early 2000s, I've talked in past podcast episodes mm -hmm. about how they um, really pushed for certification and both setting up certifications and standards for training astrologers, but also focused on things like ethics and creating a code of ethics and doing um, ethics training for astrologers. And so that's something that you started bringing into China with some of your your training and some of your your school, basically, right? Yes, that's that's right. Okay. So what what did that involve? Like what what types of things did you start doing, or what's involved in like the ethics? training for ESAR, for example? Well, we brought over the first year, uh, which would have been 2013, we brought over four trainers uh, from you know, from ESAR. Okay. Uh, Monica Domino and uh, Chris McRae and Giselle Terry, mm -hmm. even though she got stuck in Hong Kong for a little bit because of her flight, um, and Dorothy Oja. Uh, okay. They were all, we brought them to Beijing. Dorothy taught, uh, I did a, a ethics workshop or class and did the ethics test. Mm -hmm. We did consulting skills training. We even trained people to become trainers and so forth. Um, and Con and consulting we had, skills training. That that's actually a really interesting <laughs> one. What did you do? What what's the consulting skills training involve? Uh, consulting skills training is essentially um, based upon a uh, the the fact that as an astrologer, you are a kind of counselor. Mm -hmm. You know. And so it's teaching basic counseling skills. In other words, I have to say it's it's at least an introduction, you know, because it's only a three day process. It's not, right. You know, at this point, it's I'm hoping it'll be longer. Sure. But it's an introduction to um, some of the basic pros and cons that you need to know when you're working with people as a counselor. Okay. So it's it's. And it's, a, it's an eye-opener, I think, for a lot of people who've never been exposed to it. Yeah. I mean, it's really helpful because astrologers find themselves in that role where you're reading a chart, but there are some things that come up that can be really sensitive or delicate when mm -hmm. you're dealing with an individual and they're talking about some pretty sensitive stuff in their life. And if you don't have a background in like psychology or counseling already, there's some like guidelines that you you need to know about that are kind of useful as you get into that 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 mode, mm -hmm. absolutely. So that's something that you're training people on. Yes, um, and we we also teach it at our school. Okay, as well. And uh, aside from that, you're also. It seems like you're bringing over a specific type of like modern tends to be more like psychological astrology that you're teaching, right? I would say our core astrology is more humanistic, more psychological, but we encourage our students to seek out whatever kind of astrology they're interested in. Okay. Uh, one of, um, you know, in our core curriculum, you are pictured, for example. Your website is on there. If people want to know about Hellenistic astrology, you're the one to go to. Mm -hmm. All right. We had Robert Hand, of course, teach um, uh, 24 webinars for us as, as part of uh, elective courses okay. for our students. Because they we have a program that involves many teachers. So we have a core curriculum, we have electives. You know, it's important when a, a young student of astrology should trust their curiosity. Mm -hmm. Whatever they're interested in, they should be able to go study it. Doesn't sure. matter. So what if you're if if the school you went to had a humanistic philosophy, that's not the final say on everything. Sure. Know? 
Yeah, and I appreciate that. But in terms of just um, like some of the teachers that you brought over were people like Stephen Forrest, for example. Mm -hmm. um, who were other He's teachers that you brought to do in person? Tarnas. Tarnas, okay. Right. Um, of course, uh, Glenn Perry mm -hmm. um, and Sue Tompkins, who's okay. one of our core curriculum teachers, founder, original founder of the LSA, London School of Astrology. Okay. You know? And um, of course, um, we had Jeff for a while, you know? Uh, yeah, um, before he passed away just a few years ago, really right. sort of suddenly and un unexpectedly. That's correct. And um, that was actually the, the last time I saw him was at an, an ESAR conference. Um, it must have been the one in Arizona in like 2013 or 2014. That's right. Were you at that conference? Mm -hmm. No, I was not at that conference. Okay. But I was at the memorial service in in uh, 2015. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The one that Jeff had forecast unknowingly in the Mountain Astrologer. Oh, right. What did he say? In you know, he used to write the forecast material for Mountain Astrologer. Yeah. yeah I remember that. He was the core like forecast guy for years, mm -hmm. for it must have been as long as I was reading, which was like probably ten years, fifteen years up to that point. And I'll send it to you I'll send you the exact thing that he wrote by email just so you can look at it and go, Oh my God. All right. Right. Uh, but essentially what he wrote, because he would turn these things in months in advance, so he turned this into uh, the Mountain Astrologer in early December before he knew, you know, what was going on with him health-wise. Right. And he described uh, the exact weekend of his memorial service. Uh, it was in the old moon in Pisces and then the new moon in Pisces. Mm. Like, and the new moon was at like 28 degrees Pisces. Right. Mm. And he described it as being like uh, the death of someone you loved, who's surrounded by everyone, you know, mm. that loved them and now must move on. I mean, he described his own memorial service. Wow, that's yeah. wild. Yeah, because yeah, I'll send it to you. It's like whoa, you know? right? Because um, he, it was like he he would have submitted that like months in advance, right. and then but he was diagnosed with cancer, I think, early in the following year, and mm -hmm. then it was like really quick really after quick. that. That's right. Yeah, which is how he wanted it. Sure. You know, so we had uh, other teachers. We've had we've had Hadley Fitzgerald mm -hmm. um, teach. Uh, we have Adrian Duncan. Okay. Uh, Lynn Bell. In fact, uh, Lynn Bell is uh, going to be uh, coming to China for. An ESAR in China conference in November. Nice. Uh, and uh, she's 2019 doing for for this year in November 2019. Okay. We're having a small little conference. We've managed to uh, to make that happen so far. It mm -hmm. seems. Um, and Adrian Duncan has taught for us. Um, wow. But we've had quite a list actually. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good list in terms of like contemporary, like Western. But you're right, more contemporary, more psychologically oriented, more humanistic. Right. Sure. Um, okay. And in terms of that, but something changed over the course of the past decade at some point, uh, from my understanding, where uh, astrology was kind of like being practiced, but then you may have like started running into more issues with publishing well, or something. That's right. Uh, the first thing that happened was in 2014, uh, the publishing of astrology books was uh, banned uh, okay. in China. Now, so prior to that point, they were like your book, for example, was mm -hmm. that published in mainland China? That translation? Oh yeah. Okay. It, and in simplified Chinese. Um, here's the thing. Uh, you can still get a book published in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, it probably won't be in simplified Chinese, which is the Chinese alphabet that the Chinese read. Mm -hmm. It'll be in traditional Chinese, and they can read it, but it's vertical, and it's left to right. I mean, it's 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 completely different than the modern simplified Chinese. So it's hard if a book published in Taiwan is written in a style that's harder for a mainland Chinese person to read? This is correct. Now, yeah. because um, books in mainland China can no longer be published, mm -hmm. there are those in Taiwan who are now saying, hey, we should do some books in simplified Chinese. So I re just recently learned uh, that uh, there's a move in that direction. Do you know what uh, what caused that to happen in 2014? Was I, there like an event, or was it just out of nowhere? I, I, I'd, I'd rather say that I'm ignorant of that. Okay, 
It just that's what happened. It just happened. Okay, okay. sure, that's fine. Uh, we don't have to get into that, but. Mm -hmm. Um, did that cause any? So the publishing thing that oh, it meant, for is, example, Stephen Forrest was trying to get a couple of more books published. And okay, his books were like ant censored, you know. So they were stopped from being. It was yes. something like he couldn't get an ISBN number or something That's like right. that. Okay, for two books. That's um, right. So yeah, did that? Were there any other things besides just publishing or? Like, did this cause any issues in terms of you, you teaching your schools or organizing no, seminars? No, there's been or no problem with that. Okay. Um, cool. So you just continue on, and your school wasn't necessarily the only one. There's there's other schools in mainland China as well, right? There are now. Mm -hmm. um, we have both the. Uh, uh, I guess the easiest way to say this is, we had to both build the tracks and build the train. <laughs> you felt like you were doing things from scratch more yeah, when you were building yours. No, no question about it. There was any. There was no serious astrology in mainland China. Now there was an influence from Taiwan. Okay, in, and you would love this. It was a classical influence. When I first came to China, there were some students who were students of a classical teacher um, uh, in Taiwan. Right. All right. Yeah. And so there was some influence there. I'm familiar, like most of, I know a lot of Ben Dykes's books have been translated over the past decade. Uh, and I think Cecily Han is one of the main people in Taiwan who's who's been behind some of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But there was even influence before that. Uh, mm -hmm. There was um, uh, Robert Zoller uh, had a student. And this student uh, became a teacher in Taiwan. Okay. And so there was already uh, a little bit of a classical influence. Uh, in in 2009, 2010. Okay. But we were the first ones to come to China with the reinvented astrology of uh, that's more psychological, more humanistic. No one knew what that was. So anyway, to, to answer your question, yes, there are other groups have sprang up, uh, other websites, uh, people just in some instances just trying to cash in on the popularity of astrology. Um, to make to make money doing silly things, mm -hmm. and then others who are serious. Sure, yeah, I know. There's also like an NCGR group in in Taiwan right. that's great. And, that's and very active. And there's another group. They're all former students of No Doors. Mm -hmm. We expected that, you know, and they call the New Moon Group. Okay, and um, we wish them all well. We want everyone who is a serious, credible professional astrologer in China to do well, to be successful. Yeah, I know uh, Kiki Chen, who sure was a student of mine. Well, she yeah, and she was on the AFAN board at one point. Yeah, in fact, she got. I'm the one that recommended Kiki to take my old uh, position on the AFAN board. I said she's great, you know. So that's how she got that. Okay. Yeah, yeah she had um, at one point had sent an email where I was trying to research this and had some helpful notes just as I was trying to research just some background for this mm -hmm. episode. So I wanted to actually give her a shout out for that. Um, yes. Hello, Kiki. And she does the the new <laughs> new moon. Or she's connected with the right. new moon school. And, you said right, and the new moon group, um, uh, of course, uh, eventually um, connected with Frank Howard and the uh, uh, London School of Astrology. Okay, with Frank uh, Clifford, Clifford. Sorry, Frank Clifford. Frank Clifford and the London and the LSA. Got it. And um, that's right. And t essentially, um, we. No door encouraged in the beginning when the New Moon Group first started off. We we supported them before they actually, you know, began their own more serious programs with Frank Clifford. Mm -hmm. uh, we were supporters of them, and we still are, even though we're in competition. So what? Sure. You want to see that? You want to, You you want to have diversity? Yeah. One of the things that I it seems like there's so much interest that's been generated in astrology at this point that mm -hmm. there, maybe there's a lot of students and other people that are enthusiasts of astrology to sort of go around at this point, I, I would assume. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we so now the trains can run on the tracks that we built. Sure. You know. Um so in terms of that, where are you at at this point? You're you're organizing seminars still and you, you mentioned that conference that's mm -hmm. coming up later this year. Well that's an ESAR event. Okay. And so ESAR has a strong and growing membership mm -hmm. in China. And of course, we still have our own Nodor School of Astrology, which is doing really well. Mm -hmm. We have um, full-time staff, 
uh, spread out over uh, four cities uh, of 17 people that are full time. Mm -hmm. And we have um, part time, maybe seven, another seven or eight people part time. Okay. Um, and we stay very busy. I mean, I know you're a busy astrologer, and I, the crazy busy life I've created for myself in China is about 12 hours a day, six days a week at least. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so what what is it like? Are there any things that you've had to get used to as you adapted? Because I assume like astrology, as I've studied it in different cultures and, and especially down through history, it seems like astrology always adapts to whatever its host culture is. And mm -hmm. while there's some parts of it that are kind of you know, immutable or, or timeless, there are some parts of it that, that sort of grow and adapt just based on the cultural sensibilities of mm -hmm. the context in which it's being practiced. Mm -hmm. Are there any things like that that you had to adjust about your oh, approach to astrology yes. as you sort of learned just what the culture was like in China that was different than where you started practicing in Atlanta? Clearly. And let me just say this. Before I went to China, I was fat and happy. Okay. Essentially, <laughs> in Atlanta, I had a very comfortable practice, and I had stopped taking new clients and referring them to others. And I had clients that had been with me for many, many years, and even their their kids, when they became adults, became my clients. And, okay. And I was, if you would ask me in 2009, even early 2009, before I got the book deal, if you had said you know, what are your plans and are you happy? And I would have said, yeah, I love this. I feel lucky every day to be an astrologer, you know. So you had a full, like thriving consultation practice? That's correct. How many, what's, how many clients would you see a day? Like there's different, I'm always, I always ask different astrologers mm -hmm. that question because I'm fascinated by like some astrologers doing just like one or two clients a day is a lot for them in terms of their energy output, whereas others like Rick Levine will just do like a ton of yeah. clients in a single day without batting an eye. Well, I don't know if it was without betting, you know, I, but I would say uh, the average was pretty simple. It was between 17 and 20 a week. Okay. You know, so three to four a day. Three to four a day. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot. Five days a week, but it was a normal 40 hour week. You can do that. Sure. In a 40 hour week and have a weekend and have a life. Right. You know, and, and be quite happy, which I was. Sure. But the fact of the matter is, I didn't know I could be happier in terms of fulfillment because. It's one thing to say, wow, astrology has been very good to me. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to be able to share your experience with young people who are so enthusiastic. So when you ask me about Chinese students mm -hmm. and are, how are they different and what did I have to learn, I had to reinvent myself as a teacher. Right. Um, things that I kind of assumed could be grasped even with translation were not grasped as easily. Let, let me explain briefly. Mm -hmm. um, in a general sense, Chinese students are the smartest students I've ever encountered, by mm -hmm. and large. Okay. Incredibly smart. Um, have incredible memories, unbelievable memories, and powerful logic. Mm -hmm. So logic, memories, superior minds in that sense. But struggling with holistic thinking. Okay. What do you mean? Define holistic in this context. The, in other words, uh, holistic in the context of being able to relate the part of the chart to the whole of the chart. Okay. Very simple. Sure. You know, in a Western student would uh, be able to grasp that connection more readily. You know, be able to think that way more creatively, mm -hmm. and even take the initiative creatively, but was not the case uh, with students there. So I found myself having to teach holism. And so I had to kind of relearn my own, I had to think, what do I know and what do I not know? Right. So it was, it was a remaking of me as a teacher, I can tell you, because they would ask me very tough questions mm -hmm. um, from a logical point of view. Well, what about this aspect and what about this thing? and does it always manifest this way? And why doesn't it always manifest this way? And, mm -hmm. and, and I would say, well, because you have to, every chart is different and you need to compare this back to the rest of the chart. So I've learned how to teach that, Okay, but it was uh, a wonderful challenge. I loved it actually. Were there any 
like I don't know whether to overplay this or or underplay this, but whether and if I'm overplaying this, but uh, <laughs> different like philosophical or like metaphysical assumptions that you were making as even like an American mm. when you were teaching astrology that didn't connect or that you sure. were surprised when you when you realized you were trying to translate to a different audience where they weren't where that was like different for them in any way. Like mm. I don't know if. Um, Maybe I'm overemphasizing. I'm just curious if there were any things like that that you were unexpected things that you ran into that were different from like a philosophical perspective. Sure, there was um, a, in a general sense, the philosophy of the society was much more fatalistic. Just in general, oh, it was more fatalistic. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So you and you're coming at it from like a like a humanistic yeah. standpoint. So we not only had to teach astrology, we had to teach humanistic philosophy. Okay. And personal growth and person centered that had no concept or in holism. See, that's funny because one of the challenges that I have, we've had a, doing traditional astrology is that Western, like Americans especially, are so steeped in humanism that teaching anything, even a little bit of, of the opposite of a sort of determinism, is so almost foreign to them mm -hmm. that that's one of the major sticking points for even being interested in older forms of astrology for a lot of uh, Westerners is just not being able to deal with almost even any level of determinism to a certain extent. So it's funny, mm -hmm. it's interesting, or the first thing I think of when you say that is just the contrast then, mm -hmm. if the issue you ran into is you were bringing in a sort of humanism to otherwise a, a more deterministic mindset. Yeah, there was just no awareness that you could look at a birth chart and um, learn from the birth chart things that might help you to develop mm -hmm. in terms of whether you want to call it personal growth or personal development or just improving yourself mm -hmm. you know there was no awareness that you could use a chart that way they 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 thought of it um as an in, as a purely deterministic thing you know i i mean the kind of questions that were asked me in 2010 when i was on the book tour would be questions like i was told that uh, because I have um, Saturn in the fifth house, square the moon, that I will never have children. Okay. It's just kind of, or somebody will say, my son was born with the moon in the eighth house, and I was told this means I will die soon. Okay. And th there were these kinds of questions commonly asked. You know. And so your part of your process then in reacting to that, I can imagine, would have been because that was a big deal in, in like late 20th century astrology mm -hmm. was the rejection of some of those more deterministic and almost like fatalistic interpretations mm -hmm. and an attempt to, when we talk about humanism mm -hmm. and bring, importing that into astrology, we're talking about um, trying to encourage looking at the chart as having more options and having more freedom to negotiate the way that different placements will manifest. And so that's something you were probably really emphasizing in what you were teaching in response yeah, to questions like I that. I was, but I was doing it as gently as possible, you know, really, because mm -hmm. I'm I'm a foreigner and I don't want to be one of these Americans over there saying, "Hey, y you know, you guys don't know what you're doing." <laughs> you know? Right. I'm uh, all I am is an astrologer who was like a country doctor in some ways. In other words, I was practicing astrology 5 days a week very happy and had learned a few things mm -hmm. you know along the way in practicing and and I was just looking for a way to find a way to share that with them that would actually make sense in their lives actually work you know sure um I understand historically the sensitivity that astrologers have around the whole issue of forecasting and prediction I understand it from a concern from a psychological point of view concern from uh, trying to Established astrology along more credible lines in society. I mean, it's a huge subject, right? Yeah. But that's one of the things astrologers emphasized, especially humanistic astrologers emphasize, is the the notion that astrology is not um, literally predictive. That it's more about making instead of a prediction, you're making a forecast, because then it's mm -hmm. something. A, a forecast is like a qualified prediction. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that you're you're emphasizing in your general philosophy. Yeah, but I'm also. Um, of course, in the sense that, uh, I mean, there's some things in your life you have control over and there's some things you don't. Sure. In very common sense about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I'm really coming from a practice base of just dealing with people every day for years. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's I, I, real common sense about this. Because many astrologers will say, hey, you know what? The example I gave the client 
to explain something in their chart turns out to be something that actually happened mm -hmm. you know and that's a good thing nothing wrong with that right you know you've 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 actually given an example that validates something and it turns out to be something that actually happened in their life you know now people will say well, that's because it was in the past okay. and not in the future right and that gets into an interesting discussion about what is the future mm -hmm. and uh, so forth but i don't know if we go down that road we'll be in here for hours <laughs> sure yeah we don't have to yeah. we've had a few episodes about that about fate yeah, sure. and free will and forecasting right. and things like that and multiple it, realities in the future and all sort of things right yeah. um but it's an interesting i mean that's an interesting thing that you bring up in terms of just the philosophical differences mm -hmm. because you would be that was something that developed over the course of a few decades in the west of the emergence especially with like the pluto and leo generation that came in in the 1960s and 70s of which i assume that you're one of them are you pluto sure. and leo okay yeah, i'm one of those of course i am you know but that was like a development over the course of a few decades mm -hmm. of some of those discussions about you know prediction versus forecasting mm -hmm. or ethics and bringing more psychological and more humanistic sort of counseling models into astrology mm -hmm. and this is something that you're just sort of arriving with suddenly with your school and and teaching people in in mm -hmm. 2010 in, a, right. in a different context and in a much more rapid time frame that's correct mm -hmm. okay were there any other things like that that were different um culturally that you had to adapt to even when doing like delineations i assume that you started do, did you start doing consultations with individuals in china not in the beginning because okay. i went through a, it's been a long sometimes painful but necessarily painful process uh because i had an established clientele and so for a long time in the beginning i would go back to the u.s see my clients when i'm in china i'm talking to them on skype okay all right and so also teaching and so my hours got longer and longer because i'm trying to still service my clients in the u.s mm -hmm. or in europe and wherever and at the same time teaching so i'd know in the beginning i did not take any clients okay in in china did you start learning chinese or do you have I'm still a... learning chinese okay do you have a flow like some people languages come really easily to them i am i am not one of those people it's taken me <laughs> a long time just to pick up like some ancient greek and things like mm -hmm. that uh how are you with languages i don't know i would say um um i would be learning chinese for the rest of my life mm -hmm. and, and since i've been trying to learn chinese for the last nine years though in the beginning i wasn't there as much it's i've really only lived there full time for the last four years okay all right um it's it has made every other language that i hear sounds so easy right yeah now when i hear spanish i'm like wow or french or german or whatever i'm like oh that's so much easier right which are all like related in sure. some way to english by you know root languages mm -hmm. but the romance languages but uh with chinese i've heard that even like the inflection really oh. changes it's majorly. a tonal right it's a tonal language and there's four tones or okay. five if you have a neutral tone but there's four tones okay if you say it wrong and then you've, you've the meaning is entirely different okay and you have to be conscious of that and they're nice about correcting you mm -hmm. all the time you so know? so then when you do like a consultation or well let's I say i have a translator you have a translator okay that's right got it and when i teach i have a translator but more and more Whenever I have an opportunity, I will speak Chinese to my staff, mm -hmm. uh, to friends, uh, to say sometimes things to even a client in in Chinese. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, great. And I'm trying to think of other questions I had about that in terms of the language. One of the things that I've had an issue with in reviving Hellenistic astrology is sometimes not having terms for mm. like having to come up with new terms that don't exist yet for words that were used in ancient greek for like technical terms mm. did you run into that as an issue where you guys have had to like come up with new terms yes. for astrological concepts that don't exist yet in chinese yes okay mm. what are some examples of that mm. or can you think of any examples so it's it's more about um even the word for soul for example which is not an astrological word you know right uh, but 
the whole, essentially, the current language of astrology in China, Western astrology, mm -hmm. has been developed as the result of what we did. Okay, so you guys <laughs> feel like you've been pioneers where you've had to invent a lot of new terminology, like for or just take Chinese words and, and use them in a new way. Okay. Yeah, because I'm thinking of things like like secondary progression mm -hmm. or transit. Sure, all of or, that. Or like sextile, for example. Well, then it's a six, so you know. Six. Right. So you can, meaning you'll just use the, the Chinese number for six. Okay. You know, and that becomes the, you know, the aspect and so forth. So right. It, so you just take the language and simplify it in terms of the translation, but it means, you know, creating new you words know, like, Eighth house is ba gong, house is gong, so ba gong, you know. Um, it's the same all the way around. But these terms were never used that way before. That didn't exist. You wouldn't ever say eighth house in, that had no meaning in, in, in China. You know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, it's really interesting because what you, the words that you pick, I've always tried to be really conscious as we're reviving Hellenistic astrology because I've seen in past traditions. Uh, like in the eighth century or in the twelfth century, like translators will pick terms that would end up being used for like centuries after that. So mm -hmm. I'm sure some of the terminology that you guys have selected to the extent that it catches on and becomes like common phrases mm -hmm. will end up being, you know, terms, you know, that that almost creative choice that you made in choosing one term over another mm -hmm. could end up uh, influencing traditions for centuries. Mm -hmm. Yes. Has that ever has that weighed on you at all? Or I guess since you're working a lot with translators, sometimes they're the ones making some of those creative decisions, and you're yeah, like relying are. on them. And we'll discuss it mm -hmm. because I'll say, you know, afterwards uh, or during break, I'll say, "Well, I heard you thinking about that. What did you come up with?" Right. And we'll discuss it. Okay. You know? And it's interesting. Yeah, that's something that's just fascinating to me in terms of languages um, because astrology is weird sometimes where sometimes you can just find a term in a host language that mm -hmm. kind of matches but other times you have to kind of like transliterate from another language sure. and just a lot of times it's just the english word itself doesn't translate right like we use the word you know in astrology one of the overused words is the word dynamic okay right it has no literal translation in chinese at all. okay for example, there's, just, there's a lot of words like that. Yeah, that's funny. So it sort of forces you to think more in trying to teach it, because mm -hmm. that happens just in teaching astrology. They say my te one of my first teachers, Demetra George, always said that one of the best mm -hmm. ways, eventually, that you go through in your career to learn astrology or to check what you learned is attempting to teach it to somebody else, because sometimes in the process of doing so, you learn. You really have to think more deeply about some of the things that you think you know. And come to a deeper deeper level of understanding when trying to transmit that to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's yeah. been another experience for you in trying to transmit it to another language. Yes, and the translation evolves with the translator. I mean, as, as our translators, we have an amazing set or group of translators mm -hmm. who have been trained in astrology as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and wow, to, as their awareness and knowledge of astrology evolves, so does their translating capacity. Okay. And that's fun too. Right. Know? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to think of some other areas that I meant to touch on. Sure. So uh, do you feel like, like I've been noticing over the past couple of years that there's suddenly been this explosion in the popularity of astrology amongst younger people in their 20s mm -hmm. and even teens. And especially it seems like the Pluto and Sagittarius generation is starting to come into the mm -hmm. field very suddenly and very abruptly here in the West. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed any um, generational or any sort of spikes like that in terms of people coming into the field in China over the past decade? Or yes. has it been, yes, you have? Okay. Yes, no no question. Um, mm. Our student body is mostly in their 20s. Okay. Um, and we'll, get, we'll be getting more and more um, of the Pluto and Sag generation with time. And, and we have a certain, Percentage of students who are also in their thirties, okay, and through their mid thirties, and then it starts to taper off. Maybe the oldest student will be forty, you know, but most of them are in their twenties. Is we, there no uh, like Pluto and Leo equivalent, like generational thing for, you know, because in the in the West, like your your generation, there's there was such a huge group of them that came mm -hmm. in in the sixties and seventies. Well, um, most of our students are Pluto and Scorpio. 
We have some Pluto and Libra, but most of them are Pluto and Scorpio. Okay. And uh, most of our staff is, well, some of them are Pluto and Libra, certainly. That's uh, most of them, you know, my assistant, my executive assistant is a Pluto and Scorpio. Okay. And um, most of them are. So, I mean, it's kind of fun working with young people, I have to say. Right. It's 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 exciting, you know. I mean, we bring over, we like to say that we bring the best from the West. So I hope we bring you there someday. I'm sure. That'll be fun. Yeah. I did a workshop for the first time for the NCGR Taiwan group with mm -hmm. Maki uh, just a few <sighs> months ago. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting that you ha you're having that experience and working with all those people because, of course, they would be people who you already would have been an astrologer working with charts when some of those people were born in like right. the 1980s and stuff. And I'm only just now in my career starting to have that experience where I'm starting to run into astrologers now who have birth charts from like transits I remember looking mm -hmm. at in like the late 90s. There are your 2000s. transits right there. Right. Yeah. So I'm sure you've got a lot of those in terms of your students and some of the people that you're working with yes. um, with your school. Absolutely. Um, being in China has, has transformed me. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, I don't know if, if you look at relocation astrology, mm -hmm. um, natally I have Pluto in the eighth house, okay. in my natal chart. But there in China, it's in my first house. And in fact, in Beijing, Pluto is conjunct my ascendant. Interesting. So your Pluto ascendant line runs right through Beijing? Very, very near. And what, uh, do, what degrees? All through the you? eastern part of, of China. What degree is your Pluto? Uh, 19. 19 Leo? Leo. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And uh, so literally going to a place that has transformed me. Right. You know, changed my whole life little by little. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the most painful part of it has been downsizing my practice in the US mm -hmm. and, and in Europe. I've, I've referred a lot of my clients out. I still have a core group of clients that I still consult me on Skype and when I'm in the US. Mm -hmm. But that's been a, that's been a struggle for me. Sure. You know. Yeah, because you build up those relationships over the I course know. of like decades, yes. and then you, you, when your priorities change or just your focus mm -hmm. changes and your availability changes, sometimes you you just can't serve them as frequently sure. as you used to. Something tells me you know about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, doing the podcast over the past few years, getting so busy and doing four episodes a month has shifted it. So I've had to refer a lot of my clients to to Lisa or to my mm -hmm. friend Patrick Watson. Right. Yeah. And, that, and it's 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 a challenge. You know, you have to let go. Yeah, because yeah. you've built relationships with That's these right. people, and you've come to know a lot about their their personal lives, and come to like care about like what's going on in their life, and, and almost enjoy checking in from time to time to hear the latest mm -hmm. update of of what chapter of their life they're in today. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, also during the entire time I've been in China, I've had one Pluto transit after another. Okay. As I'm sitting here today, Saturn is exactly square my sun. Okay. And uh, or within minutes, whatever. And Pluto is retrograded back square my son in Libra. What degree? It's my son is if you round it off, it's twenty one. Okay. You know, degrees, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's twenty plus, you know. Twenty one Libra. Yeah. Got it. Um and on my way as you know, on my way here today, I got in this fierce uh dust storm here in Denver. Right. Uh dust devil, in fact, uh, uh swept through the parking lot. Knocking down some small children who were getting out. Their oh no! Cars, you know, and it was quite a blast. Actually, I thought, well, you know, no, I'm going to make it to Chris's regardless. You know. Yeah, and what's <laughs> funny about that is I was also like struck down with a, a cold today, so we weren't sure. I, I sort of pushed through, and right. I have to thank you for doing it nonetheless. And apologies to everybody listening to this if my voice sounds a little different, but uh, has a deeper tone to it. Yeah, yeah. good for radio, <laughs> like like yours. Um, all right. I'm trying to think of some of the other areas that I meant to go into in terms of what do you see the future of astrology in China being like? What I'm hoping is that we continue to grow, um, even with astrology remaining in a gray area. Okay. Uh, legally. That's what you consider it to be at this point, like yes. a gray area legally? That's, in other words, astrology is tolerated. Okay. And that, I think that's the best way I could say it. Um, Therefore, the need to be responsible has even more repercussions than normally in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope simply that the profession, uh, the practice and study of astrology uh, just continues to develop in China. And maybe I'm hoping they will 
this is idealistic, of course, but I'm hoping that they will somehow, even in their environment, do better than we have. You know, mm -hmm. uh, find new ways of doing what we do. Maybe they will reinvent the astrology in a way we never thought about. Yeah. You know, I mean, that excites me. Because that happens. I mean, just in the history of astrology, like astrology sometimes is, it's transmitted to one culture and sometimes merged with their culture or synthesized with some pieces of their indigenous forms of astrology. Mm -hmm. And then eventually after a period of time, sometimes it gets transmitted back in a different form or it in, ends up influencing other cultures further down the line in interesting and, and unique ways. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing, of course, is it's so exciting to see your students graduate, become ESER caps, et cetera, and go on and become very successful in their practice mm -hmm. early on, you know, in those first few years. And you you see them, they come by and visit, you know, come by the office and visit, come by the school or go out to lunch, whatever, and they're they're doing it. So there are they're, astrologers, there's professional astrologers uh, that are making yes. a living doing astrology as their primary profession in yes. China at this point? Yes. Okay. Um, and it's, it's so fulfilling. It's maybe the most fulfilling thing I've ever experienced in my life is to see that. Sure. And to see them uh, doing it even faster sometimes than I did it. You know? Right. A lot of times I'll just say that to my students. And it's I, I look at them and I say, most of you are probably a lot smarter than me, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to share with you what I know and let's see what you do with it. Right. You know? Yeah, that's always really fulfilling as a teacher to mm -hmm. be able to like teach somebody what you know, but then see them go off and um, exceed you or do even better mm -hmm. or find things that you didn't even know or do things that you didn't know were possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. Um, are there uh, astrology apps or applications or programs that are used in China that we don't necessarily know about in the West? Yes. Okay. Um, all kinds, uh, you know. And I'm all of a sudden trying to think of, of as Tutu is probably the most popular. Mm -hmm. uh, Tutu has everything on it. I, I, I know that Nodor would like to have all of those things too, but they went faster than we did with the technical aspect. We have we have some um, products also. Mm -hmm. We have a tech team in Shaman. We have four people that are part of our own tech team for Nodor. Okay, um, but. There are. I mean, there's all kinds of astrological um, software and products and uh, things that you can use. And Nodor has them too, with, you know, chart calculation and mm -hmm. all these kind of things. And, you know, where you can go and get interpretations and, in Chinese. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I'm just curious, um, you know, because there's some astrology software programs that, that we know about that we use, like Solar Fire mm -hmm. or. Uh, what have you, or websites like astro.com, although I know that they increasingly translate different portions of their website mm -hmm. into into different languages, which is great. Right. Um, but well, we, we tell them about, I mean, they know, I mean, since I've been there, of course, I told them about Kepler and Solar Fire and, mm -hmm. and astro.com. And, you know, to get to the Western sites, a student in China has to use a VPN. Oh right, it's good because they, so they have to use uh, like a workaround sometimes in order to access websites that aren't um, uh, sort of endorsed by the government. So that might be a reason why they might not be able to access certain like astrology sites. A lot of sites cannot be accessed anymore. They okay. They it was different, and the internet has become more managed. Mm -hmm. You know, increasingly, there used to be a lot of uh, VPNs. Now there's very few. Okay. And um, it's you know it's just reality, mm -hmm. just the way it is. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So astrology apps is one of the things I was curious about. Mm -hmm. um, are there other? I wish I had my tech people here. They could give you all kinds of details. About sure. That. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe some people could post in the comment section that are listening either to the audio version of this on the mm -hmm. astrology podcast website or on the YouTube version. Uh, some links to some things like that, just because mm -hmm. this is part of a general. Just I'm curious what is available or what's out mm -hmm. there. Um, one of the other questions I had is if there's other. I know that you've brought ESAR certification to to China mm -hmm. through your school. Are there other? Have there been other movements to do certification in China by other groups? Mm, not that I'm aware of, except for of course um, the, the whatever kind of d degree or diploma 
they might get from the London School of Astrology through Frank Clifford. Okay. Um, Because that's a a new thing that um, New Moon is offering. Mm -hmm. But as far as anything comparable to ESAR, nothing nothing yet. Okay. Um, ESAR has really uh, advanced a lot. I mean, there's about 300 uh, Chinese members of ESAR now, and out of that number, a lot of them have joined in the last two years. Okay. Um, And... We have our own. One of the things, something you might find interesting, since you're a teacher, Mm -hmm. uh, is our teaching process is kind of revolutionary in a way. What we do, uh, you know, we have online and offline teaching, but but we also have a teaching assistant, uh, customer support person, you know, student support, and a a TA, teaching assistant. Mm -hmm. And in between the webinars, that we do for our students as part of all of our programs. Uh, we also have um, w- little webinars in between uh, from the TA. Uh, the TA will teach a salon, mm-hmm. as they say. They like to use that term salon, the, the French word more. Uh, and so, and every class um, has its own WeChat group. Okay. And WeChat is of course a platform part of the social media, but it's a, uh, you create groups that are closed groups and it becomes a way for people to discuss the astrology they're learning 24 seven. Okay. So we have all of that. We have so many groups and I'm in most of them. It's very wonderful and time consuming trying to keep up with it. Right. Cause there's different social media sites in, in China. Right. Oh, and yeah. that's one of the absolutely. ones that's, that's permissible or open. Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. And I mean, the biggest one is Weibo, which is a microblog. Okay, you know, and where I have, I'm able to, to comment and talk about things every day, whether it's in my personal life or uh, sharing things about astrology in some way every day. Right, and you actually have a lot of followers on Weibo, right? It's developed. Yeah, it came out of Cena.com. Okay, uh, we it's still owned by Cena.com, mm-hmm. and uh, at this point, it's one point two seven. A million uh, followers uh, are on Weibo. Wow. And um, it's such an opportunity. I mean, I'll be telling them, talking more about you on my Weibo in the next week. I'll have some pictures of us on there and talk about you and what's going on. They're all, they want to know. They want to know about astrology in the West. And sure. What's happening. Okay. So it's a lot of fun. But, but going back to the teaching model, mm-hmm. um, students learn faster, not just from listening to the teacher and the TA. They learn that way, mm-hmm. but they learn from each other. Right. So having these these groups, these sharing groups, is such an important part of the learning process. I love that. Right. You know. Yeah, forums are really important and crucial, and that's been one of the major ways that astrology I've seen I've seen has changed in the West over the past mm-hmm. decade is the ability for astrologers to meet up and just talk with each other, even if they're not physically located mm-hmm. uh, through forums. Are there other um, I've noticed, especially in the past ten years, different websites, uh, different platforms that astrologers are using in order to promote themselves and also mm-hmm. talk about astrology, like like Twitter or YouTube or podcasts. Mm-hmm. Do you see anything like that in China in terms of yeah, acceptable platforms? Problem, like yeah, that? but it's not it's not as easy to do. In okay. other words, uh, I've been on um, and Felicia uh, Jiang, who's mm-hmm. my uh, co-founder of Nodor. Is also on television there from okay. time to time, and also internet TV. Mm-hmm. Um, but and we do podcast, um, but we are also mindful of the uh, limits of that too. So it's, it's a regulated kind of thing. There's there's some platforms where we really cannot post. Okay, you know, so we have to be discriminating in how we go about it and respectful. Um, of the structure of society there. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure in terms of some of the things that you're doing with ethics training mm-hmm. and counseling skills training, that part of the purpose of that is maybe to help guide and shape the practice of astrology in China in order to make sure that people are doing things that are ethical, that are not going to be harmful to people, mm-hmm. and also not going to get astrologers in trouble, I assume. Sure. But I mean, and I think all astrologers all responsible astrologers, our basic rule is do no harm. Right. It's pretty basic. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, which is is great, and I'm, I know most people, everybody approaches it pretty much from that perspective. Mm-hmm. But sometimes, just knowing or being taught like what could be harmful to mm-hmm. a person, sometimes that doesn't isn't like immediately. If you're not, if you don't have that background training in like counseling or something, mm-hmm. sometimes just knowing some basic guidelines or being taught that can be helpful as you shift into more of that practice. That's right. Sure, absolutely. And we're evolving that. Uh, I can I can say. On here, for example, this is something I'll be presenting tomorrow to the ESAR board, so you could say this is hot news mm-hmm. or if you want to. All right. Which is, which is that um, uh, the ESAR exam will also now have a consultation exam as part of its revised program. We are, we've been working very hard over the last year mm-hmm. with our new board to uh, rejuvenate, revitalize everything about ESAR, and we are all working together very happily. After we're we're happy to be here in Denver. We're looking forward to twenty twenty. Yeah. But our consulting skills training, the exam, the ethics, all of that is continuing now to really evolve and grow. And so I'm excited to say that that, that whole certification process I think is going to become increasingly at least from a liberal arts point of view, more reflective of the astrological community than it's ever been. Okay. And yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited. Um, so all of the ESAR board. Let's talk a little bit about that. When mm-hmm. did you join the ESAR board? Um, 2017 in this in the early part of 2017. Okay, so just in the past couple of years, right. and it, it does seem like a new group has come into the board and sort of infused it with some new energy over the past two years. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys, you've became the vice president. When yes. was that? Um, sometime in the last year. Okay, uh, right after Alexander became president. Uh, Alexander M. Sirajic? M. Sirajic, yes. Okay. Yeah, I was a supporter of his. Um, actually, when we were uh, in, was it August? Yeah. August of 2017, when we had a an ESAR board meeting, mm-hmm. um, was when uh, Alexander was elected president. Okay. And, and he has a large astrology school. He in, does. Yeah. Uh, where, where again? What city? Are you? And, um, Belgrade in Belgrade, okay, yeah. in Serbia, Serbia, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. got it. I right. mean, that's actually kind of interesting yeah. and unique and different, actually, compared to in the past, where uh, a lot of like the, especially the U.S. organizations have tended to be run by, you know, people from the U.S. or people with schools in the U.S. Mm-hmm. But it's actually interesting at this point that um, Alexander has like this large school in Serbia, or one mm-hmm. of the larger schools there in Europe. And is the president of ESAR now, and you have a large school, of course, in in China. That's right, three three thousand students, active student body. Right, and mm-hmm. you're the vice president. So ESAR, in that way, is starting to take on more of a sort of international role uh, to reflect its name. That's right. With and we now have global directors. We used to call them vice presidents, but that became very confusing to people. Right. You know, so what, you've, what you you changed that? the terminology mm-hmm. for that. That's right. So and, how does that work again? Uh, a global director is someone who represents ESAR in a certain country. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes they have schools, not always, mm-hmm. uh, and they will often be involved with some of the programs that ESAR has in terms of consulting skills training, ethics training, okay. and exam. And um, it's, it just continues to grow, getting a, you know, a global director in Norway or getting a new one in Cyprus or you know, and we're excited about this. Yeah, my friend Paula Bellomini, I believe, just became the director in Brazil. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's you know to be a part of that is such an opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it's great because it does create more of uh, an, an international orientation for the organization, um, and I'm hoping some of that gets reflected in terms of the conference. I know usually mm-hmm. when I attend past ESAR conferences. I've really enjoyed it in terms of being able to meet more international astrologers from around the world at those conferences compared to to other ones. Yeah, I think you'll see that here in Denver. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a little bit since that's actually what you're here for this week. Yes. Um, you you guys scheduled this conference. It's happening in September of 2000, uh, 2020, next right. year, so a year and a half from now right. here in Denver. Um, it's going to be a week-long conference. Mm-hmm. Early September. Early September, okay. 
And you guys are really focusing, especially in terms of the theme of the conference, because usually conferences have like some sort of theme or orientation, but it's focused on the Jupiter Saturn conjunction that's occurring mm -hmm. next year. That's right. Okay. In Aquarius. That's right. In Aquarius, right. Yeah. There's like a ton of like mundane shifts, it seems like next year in terms of different different things going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And there's going to be, uh, it's going to be broken up into tracks, right? Y yes. Uh, even though uh, all I can say at this point is that our, is that uh, the membership, of course, uh, is always involved in selecting of speakers for the conference. Yeah, I mean, you guys just did voting. That actually just concluded today. In, today, yes. Okay, for I mean, well, the today, member, the vetting and voting, and it's such a process. And we, I, all I can tell you is that you'll see more diversity, uh, more uh, more young people than ever, mm -hmm. which is really what we're for. We want to see more of that, right? You know, I mean. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I'm part of the old Pluto and Leo generation, you know, and whatever I can do to kind of at least set a groundwork for ESAR to evolve mm -hmm. beyond even where it is now, it's it's exciting to do it. But it's going to be others. It's going to be people, young younger people like you mm -hmm. and others and your students and others who get involved with ESAR uh, more so, who will eventually be on the board. And we'll take what we're doing and do more with it, go further with it. This is, you know, what's exciting to me. Yeah. Well, I appreciated that you guys did. Um, you tried to make the speaker selection process more democratic yes. with this recent round where you just finished uh, this month the f selecting the first 30 speakers. Mm -hmm. And that was actually done by a vote from the entire ESAR membership. That's right? correct. And they ended up picking 30 of what will be the first 30 speakers that were chosen. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting to see because it did result in a kind of diverse array of different astrologers that were chosen just based on who the members yes. wanted to see speak at a conference. That's right. Um, so I, I got in. So thanks to everybody who voted for me for that. Um, <laughs> of I know, course you did. Yeah. Well, and I know my friend Kelly Surtees also got in. Um, but then there was also some more established speakers you know, that people wanted to see that also made it in. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting mixture from that. And yeah. then you guys are now trying to complete, because that was just the first 30, mm -hmm. but the final tally is supposed to be like, what, 100 speakers or something? 90. 90? Okay. Yeah, at least 90, yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those, I'm sure, will be some of the ESAR uh, regional or country directors or other people that have applied. Right. But again, uh, trying to make more room for uh, for everybody, right, and particularly diversity, right. Uh, in fact, um, you know, um, Aaliyah, one of our board members, Aaliyah, who, Aaliyah Wesla, yes, mm -hmm. Aaliyah Wesla, who's such a contributor, by the way. Uh, she gave up her speaking slot. She said, I, I, "I'm going to give up my speaking slot." So, okay, just as an example, you mm -hmm. know, and. Uh, we want to make sure too. I mean, it's like I don't want to. I just I'm just going to take one because I want somebody else to have it. Right. You know, this is really our our attitude. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. She was the former president of the Association That's for right. Young Astrologers, and then recently, in the past couple of years, joined the ESAR board to yes, help. Yes, we're, we're happy to have her on there. We need young people on there. That's sure. Right. Nice. Um, okay. And. I'm trying to think about anything else. Obviously, there's going to be a financial conf uh, track for that conference. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some traditional astrologers speaking, mm -hmm. um, or like a relationship track, maybe. I guess you guys are still nailing down the tracks, right? Uh, we are, I, and um, you'll see all of that online before too long. Okay. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, we'll see uh, maybe some speakers, and certainly, hopefully, some students, perhaps from China, attending the conference mm -hmm. uh, next year. Yes. Um, a few, at least. Um, as you know, we're actually doing, an, or I mentioned it, an ESAR in China mm -hmm. conference okay. uh, in November, in late November and of this year. Who's speaking at that? Um, we only have a few Westerners there. Most of the speakers, 80% of the speakers are Chinese. Okay. Uh, all, all of them uh, graduates of our program, and all of them, or 90% of them are ESAR caps. Okay. All right. Um, it is an ESAR conference. <laughs> sure. And um, well, and what's CAP stand for again? I forget. It, it stands for uh, Certified Astrological Professional. Okay. And that's ESAR's primary designation? That's right. Got it.
All right. Well, that's yes, it is. That's the that's what the CAP stands for. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, but we we have Lynn Bell uh, and Alexander uh, and his wife Leah coming, and then I'm going to be there. So we have four Westerners. Okay. But the rest of the of the workshops and lectures are all Chinese. Brilliant. Uh, where can people find out more information about that? Uh, when we get the website uh, up, which will be, we hope, within the next uh, three or four weeks. Okay. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise- I don't have it up yet. They can go to uh, nodor.com and it'll be some, some things on there about it. We don't have a separate website for it yet. Okay. So, but in the meantime, at least they can go to nodor.com in order to find out more information sure. about- your school and your work. Of course, and about the conference and ESAR and all of that, right. Okay, brilliant. Um, are there any other areas that just dealing with this broad topic about the practice of Western astrology in modern China that we should have talked upon, about today mm -hmm. or that we should touch on really quick before we wrap things up? Or do you feel like we've, we've covered quite a bit? Yeah, I, I, I like this conversation, but I'm sure that uh, later... Um, I'll think, oh, you know, we should have talked about that. Yeah. You know? So we'll uh, let's do this again sometime. You know? Yeah. Why don't we? Mm -hmm. We'll we'll call this part one, and maybe we'll say to be continued next time. Yeah. Okay. Great. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for joining me today. Thank you, Chris. All right, and thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast. Thanks to the patrons who supported it and made this episode possible. You can find out more information about subscribing to the podcast at theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. And uh, that's it. So we'll see you next time.